Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Ruth Messenger has taken her many skills and interests beyond New York to the rest of the world. As president of the American Jewish World Service, she's found another way to further social justice and human dignity. And what a way it is. I mean, this is a job just made for you. I know. I just love it. I mean, I'm very, very lucky that I found this organization and that they, and that they chose yeah. me because yeah. I didn't know much about international development right. through six years ago. But it uses a lot of the same skills. It does. It certainly does. It's all your local community-based <laughs> organizing, not only working with local organizations, but your ability to organize grassroots organizations. And it's economic development. Sex, it's all, sex, and then one of the things that's sort of exciting is if you did work like I did, like you did, in New York City, New York State for 10 or 20 years, it's sort of wonderful to discover that even it's though circumstances work. are totally different and there's a whole other piece of the world, they're still fighting for gender equity. They're still yeah. fighting for economic independence. They're still dealing with the rights of children. They're, and these groups, I guess that's really a piece of the point that I want to get across. Many of the small groups that we work with were their first funders. So they've been there forever doing this, doing local organizing, saying, hey, we have more rights. Hey, women ought to have more control over their own bodies. We need a way to, to uh, get, and they're just doing it. So and exciting, and you find exciting. this in, outside of New York. It's wonderful. It's also, I think, particularly wonderful because you grew up in this tradition of Judaism as, I don't, I'm putting words in your mouth now, That's but I would right. say as a code for living, I mean, the, 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 the concept of social justice. Absolutely, and, and in, it's got actually two elements in my family. One was the one you were talking about. Judaism is really about social justice, and that came very much from my parents. From my mother's parents, who were um, actually an unusually, uh, they were immigrants, they were poor immigrants, really only very early in the first decade or two of their lives, so they didn't have quite the same story, but they had the same sentiment. Their notion yes. was this city and this country are what has made the difference and you have to give something Maybe back. That. And of course that's a piece of what got me into government in the first place. What a better way yeah. to give something Absolutely. back me too. than in government. But now I discover that so many of the populations that I work with in places that are known and unknown around the world are basically immigrants and refugees. That's so interesting. Yeah, you know, when you, you're an American, we're all so, so whatever it is, is centric, egocentric. I think about immigrants as people who come from other countries to right. America. Right. But that's just ridiculous. They come from other countries and go or and other, to other countries or they get chased out the way the way let's say Jews got chased out of Eastern Europe uh, and Germany. They get chased out of um, Haiti and they move to the Dominican Republic where by the way they're not welcome. And uh, there's a thousand system. examples of that. It's not just that example. I just want to inject this one personal thing is that your parents and my parents knew each other and that you and I have always lived on the west side of Manhattan. We are not <laughs> world travelers were so provincial in our outlook, but look at, but that's right. fortunate. I'm so glad that you're doing this because it broadens our horizon. Exactly. No, I, used to, <laughs> I tell people when I talk about this job that for 20 years I was in city government and my boundaries were the Atlantic Ocean on the east and the Hudson River on the west. <laughs> west. <laughs> so tell me, uh, what about the organization? Well, How old is it? And what it's is 20 it? years old. It's just about to celebrate its 20th birthday. It was founded by a wonderful man named Larry Phillips who was the chief executive of the Phillips Van Heusen Shirt Company. Most people know right. the shirts. And he is more than anything else an internationalist. And his notion was he was already supporting Oxfam, which is a major yeah. international organization. But he was saying so many of Oxfam's board members and contributors come from the Jewish community, but by the time they're going to work in Zimbabwe or Peru or Cambodia, no one's making the connection. So why don't we raise money from the Jewish community educating the Jewish community about the challenges sure. around the world, and then start building bridges as we go. And that's the job I inherited. And that's we've grown it. the organization. We do basically four things very quickly. We do uh, international development. We find these small groups and we give them technical assistance and money. We run service programs. We'll take a volunteer anytime you want to go run. You just need six weeks right. to go and do organizational management, use your skills, teach some, you know, teach a group, okay, here's what you should do because you're growing. Here's how you would write a fundraising proposal. Everything from that to public health to computer experts. So we run lots of service programs, skilled for volunteers who have professional backgrounds and unskilled for college students. Then we do a lot of education in the American Jewish community. What are the challenges of the 21st century? And what role should Jews be playing? And what is the role of Jews in addressing um, the need for microfinance institutions in uh, Asia? What is the role for the Jewish community in looking at the AIDS crisis in uh, Africa? 
And then the last thing we do, which I know you wanted to talk a little bit about, is we respond to international disasters. So you have offices around this no, country? We have, no, we have. We're very sparse on infrastructure. Yeah. We have an office on West 36th Street in New York and a great website, AJWS. Yeah, it is a great website. Dot org. I have a half-time person in Chicago, part-time person in Chicago, and a part-time person in San Francisco. Both of them right now are operating out of borrowed space or their own homes. Um, because it's yeah. the 21st century. You really can do it all from right. West 36th Street. Right. You just need a body on the ground. Right. And then overseas, we're different from a lot of the very good international organizations because we don't have a staff in these countries. We find these groups that are doing the work. And you give them their startup money. And to, our staff and visits. Help. Our staff flies back and forth all the time because you have to do evaluations right. on site. You have to be accountable. Yeah. But the people really doing the work, the people organizing women to save their few rupees every day, this is a real project that in yeah, 20 years is now circulating a million dollars. Isn't that great? 20,000 women, a million dollars. And this is in South India, actually in Tamil Nadu, which uh -huh. is one of the areas hit by the uh -huh. tsunami. But the project is still there. But women what is can that? make. Is it like a loan fund? Yeah, women, uh -huh. women can take loans and pay them back over time. And actually, Americans are always shocked. The best of these microfinance programs have what we would consider high rates of interest 20 to 30 percent. But we're talking about a loan a of $30. Right. And if you don't charge that, then frankly, inflation keeps putting Scare. the group further and yeah. further behind. If you do charge something like that, then these groups actually, in five to 10 years, become independent. They, so do you go and search for these groups? Because they're not sophisticated enough to find you, are they? Um, uh, we ha I would say it's sort of half and half. Yeah. The, the web is now incredible. People, well, they're looking for funding. We get a lot of silly, I mean, yeah. I don't mind silly, but things Extraneous. that aren't appropriate for right. us, for sure, and sometimes they're not real. But also, we get groups every once in a while that write us and say, is, are, we, are we the kind of group that could apply to you? And there are gems out there, and they sometimes actually find us on the web. Right now, most of our major referrals come from the large international organizations that are in a country, Ford Foundation, UNICEF, who say, oh, you know, for that small literacy project, call these people at American Jewish World Service, go on their website. <laughs> And increasingly now, because we have 170 projects in the developing world, they come from our projects. So now, whenever a member of my program staff is going to evaluate a project that's, let's say, been working with us for two years, the first question will be, who else should we visit in the area? I see. So, and you're in how many places? We're in 30 different countries. Isn't that great? Now, the two areas that, I'm, that have had so much public notice, the Sudan, have you been, you've been I've working been to the there? Sudan. Uh, my board made an unusual decision in uh, June of 2004, which was that we would not only organize to provide humanitarian aid to the victims of a genocide in western Sudan, but that we would take this issue on as an educational and policy advocacy issue. So we would keep telling people what's happening. We would look for speaking opportunities. People who go on our website can go to the take action portion of our website, and there's usually a Sudan-related letter. The situation is horrible. It's not understood in the West, and frankly, it's being made worse right now because the Sudanese government, which is the perpetrator of this genocide, is taking advantage of the world attention being focused in South Asia. Yeah. Well, what, so what can we do? I mean, do you get political also? Um, do yes. Do you guys lobby? Can do, yes. We, you can do political. Are you a tax dedu deductible organization? We are a tax deductible organization with a single education staff person in D.C. Um, who works basically with the other faith-based organizations there, most of which are not Jewish. Yeah. Uh, Church World Service, Episcopal uh, right. Diocese, so, a lot of really good organizations. So what's really, what is happening in the Sudan? Well, in the Sudan, what has to happen is that Kofi Annan's commission, who was over there for the United Nations, has to say this is genocide sooner than we did in Rwanda, which took us 10 years. They have to look at what's happening. The government is clearly behind this. The government is now making it more difficult for the international aid community to get food in. There, I have a colleague who calls this, uh, this the situation in Darfur, in West Sudan, Rwanda in slow motion. Because instead of coming in and shooting 800 or, or macheteing 800,000 people in a week, which is what happened in Rwanda 10 years ago, in uh, Sudan, two million people have been displaced from their homes. These were poor subsistence farmers. This is a Muslim on Muslim attack, but they've displaced two hundred. What is two why, why is it? Why why is it happening? 
lots and lots of causes, more than this, than this <laughs> uh, TV program right. will allow, but just two things very quickly. It's a fight over land. What a surprise. There's not enough water. There's not enough arable land. So the grazers want it and the farmers have it, and that's a piece of the fight. And then the second thing is that the, the war is between the Muslims who identify themselves as Arab and are supported by the government, which is an Arab fundamentalist government, and the Muslims who identify themselves as African. And you know, just, you want to say this is impossible, how could this happen? But it is happening. And unfortunately, the world has had example after example of this. People that I know who went to Rwanda, or were in Rwanda in 1994, said that an outsider, a Westerner, couldn't tell the difference between a Tutu and a, and a, and a Hutsi if you right. paid them. Right. The same thing in, in Rwanda. The, the, I mean, in, in Sudan, I'm sorry. People there tell me that's a member of Janjaweed. This is a farmer. So do we they say, so this is not religious, this is political? That's correct. Political, ethnic, ethnic and, and economic in the sense that it's all, is a fight over land. Is, but the, is our government doing as much as it can? Our government is doing actually a fair amount in dollar aid in Sudan, um, but not nearly enough in tough advocacy. We ought to, instead of explaining to the world, which our government is much too good at, as to why the UN won't vote stiff sanctions, we ought to do it. We can impose tougher sanctions. Yeah. We can impose an embargo. There's an embargo right now on giving, uh, uh, selling arms to the rebels. But there's no embargo on selling arms to the government. And the government is arming the group that's attacking the other group. It's just, and a lot of people are going to die. I mean, that's yeah. like the sad part of this. You displace small subsistence farmers from their homes and set them wandering essentially in the Saharan desert, even if they get to refugee camps. The camp is precarious. The, I was in a refugee camp with 45,000 people. These are people who've never lived in a com more than a farming community yeah. of 200, and now they've got 45,000 people yeah. and little tents. So, and the tsunami has hit the area in which you have groups. Have right. you been in contact with your yes. groups? Yes. Uh, the first thing we had to do was be in contact with our volunteers. We yeah. had 12 volunteers yeah. working at various projects in India and Thailand. That was a little scary. Yeah. Our volunteers are all okay. Um, and our groups are all okay, which means that the, the group is still there. So they've lost one or two staff members. Staff members have lost relatives. But they're able to function. And so we're starting to fund them to do some on-target, on-the-ground relief work, um, evacuation planning, um, uh, water for purification. We're also, in the case of uh, South Asia, we're working in cooperation with some of the large relief groups that can do water purification for a whole yeah. part of Sri Lanka. Our particular focus in the tsunami work will be on reconstruction. We always believe in the building, the, the danger, <laughs> the relief becomes, yeah. relief has the dangerous side effect of making people dependent. Right. What you want to do instead is help people rebuild. Right. So for example, yesterday we allocated $20,000 to a community in India to buy fishing nets. Because huh. these fisher people yeah. just need to get back to work. Right. But their boats and their nets were swept out to sea, and they're able to get boats there locally. So when do you think, nets. well, that's an, that's an industry that can just pick up, right. but, but then they're going to have to transport, so that's going to be a problem. Sure. But when do you think you'll have uh, more volunteer? you'll be looking for more volunteers to really help that will That will really depend on, on country by country on what happens. The, the two countries that were the worst affected, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, are not countries with a huge base of receptivity yeah, to yeah. either small community-based organizations or to outside volunteers. Yeah. So we have to work slowly. Exactly. Does all of this activity that you now have make the United Nations a more important body in your mind? Or I mean, I assume it was pretty, it should have been. I mean, should we be spending time trying to build it up? You know, uh, do you remember when you were young and all the I do. high hopes for the I United do. Nations? I do, and so you're do asking me an embarrassing question. I don't know. What we, let me just say, we won't do it under a president and an administration like no, this. No, absolutely not. They the just try to, build, is, to break it down. Could we ever find a couple of leaders at the same time that would really do collaborative work? Now, the, the one piece of hope here, which is, frankly, with this administration, not very hopeful, but there is an international effort called the Millennium Development Goals. They were adopted in 2000 aimed at 2015. Okay, so here's the quiz that... And who's in that? Everyone, all of the, almost all of the world power signed on to this, including us. And the idea was, if everybody spends more money, but spends it thoughtfully, spends it on education, spends it on agriculture reform, spends it collaboratively, invests in the Global Health Fund on AIDS, TB, and malaria, you can drastically reduce poverty by 2015. Now, here's the really distressing set of numbers, and this has actually been an issue in the Times in the last few days. 
When you ask the American public what percentage of our budget yeah. they think goes for non-military foreign aid, the average answer is 24 percent. Right. And if you ask them, is that too much or too little, they say, that's too much. Well, what should we be giving? We should be giving, they say, 5 percent of our budget. We are actually giving point. Point one four. I was going to say three. All right, okay. now down to 0.14 percent of our budget. And the whole notion of the Millennium Goals is simply, if each of the 23 most developed countries gave 0.7, so that's less than one percent of their budget, then we could accomplish all and this. And where, where would they give it to? Well, the UN would be the coordinating for, force. So. There's this whole, there's going to be a meeting soon again on the Millennium Goals. There's a wonderful person named Jeff Sachs, who's now based at Columbia. Mm -hmm. who is behind a great deal of this and explains the kinds of ways in which the money should be used. At the same time, your organization is lobbying, I don't know if I should use the word lobby, is campaigning for an effort to forgive. Right. Uh, That's the other big piece debt. of this, is yeah. international debt. And this is like also a long story, but right. debt was, in the, in, the, in the years that you and I were growing right. up, being adults of 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the powers of be in the world and the World Bank loaned money to countries in trouble, the right instinct. Many of those countries Are still had, in trouble. well, but they had, no, but they had oh. dictators oh. who never used the money for any development purpose. And so now it's 10 years later and the country is told, you owe all this money. Yeah. And if you don't at least pay interest on the money, you'll be, um, what's the word, uh, excommunicated from the world <laughs> community. So there are countries in Africa that pay four times as much interest on a debt yeah. they will never pay back, four times as much as they spend on health care. That's terrible. So the notion is massive debt relief and debt forgiveness. So the United States did a good job in the year 2000 and forgave, I think it was $440 million worth of debt. The United States now... The World Bank is moving toward more debt forgiveness, and the next meeting of the G8, the eight big powers mm -hmm. in the world, is supposed to consider total debt forgiveness for the South Asia countries. Uh -huh. So that you could say to Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, is and that India, before the tsunami? Or no, it's being. This has been raised in the result. last week. And what about Africa? <laughs> Well, that's where some of the worst problems are. They've benefited. And actually, people may have seen in the newspaper, one of the things that African countries, a few African countries that got debt relief did, is the first thing they did was eliminate fees for school. And they now have so many. It used to be mm. this free school, yeah. but the country was charging fees, uniform, book costs, which way beyond the capacity of families to, to pay. pay. In Kenya, where they eliminated school fees, a million children showed up to go to school. So now we have to... Get educate. the capacity, yeah, we have to get the teachers, we have to get the... How, how much do you think race enters into the consideration of our country and, and Western countries? It's, it's, well, I think the West behaves as if they are guided in the world, or particularly in the developing world, by economic interest and by race-based principles. Africa always gets the least attention, the least money. It can't be an accident. No. Um, it's deliberate. And and therefore it's suffering the worst, plus it's suffering with AIDS, which I just want to add. I know Let's you know this. It, yeah. AIDS is a heterosexual disease in the developing world. It's largely transmitted by the fact that there are no jobs where people live. So they men travel. travel long distances, they drive trucks, they go to a city that might be 500 miles away, they only go home three times a year, so they are sleeping with prostitutes. You know, so it's a big surprise to tell people that sex actually goes on. So the disease is being spread. It's these are and we've countries known this in which for so long, oh, God, for so, so long. long. I remember right? a, a physicians up at Columbia Presbyterian working on some kind of a protective thing for the prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And there is some of that. I actually um, was, was. I'm going to a meeting next week. So it just about, gets worse. So the children are orphaned. The children are HIV positive. Many of them, but there there are 12 million AIDS orphans in sub-Saharan Africa. So have we spent any of the money that the president made this big announcement no. that he was going to allocate? No. He spent virtually none of that money. Most of it has gone to um, not to the global health fund, which the UN set up to, to do, do just what you were asking about before, coordinate yeah. monies right. from different sources. We're kind of stingy with the Global Health Fund, and then every once in a while they make a few grants directly through the White House, through the ambassadors. The American ambassadors in these different countries dole out a little bit of money, so it's not coordinated, it's not well thought out. Um, by the way, if you're talking about the White House and money, you, you know and, and your viewers know that we went up 
in the last eight days on the tsunami from right. 15 million to 350 million. You haven't heard the worst. Yesterday, the president was asked by the press, how much more are you going to ask Congress for? And he said nothing, which means he's going to take it from our aid and development budgets. Oh. So he's going to take the, money away so from no, aid or long-term right. planning and right. give it to relief. So there goes the, the, the There's no money, money for that. Um, I know you worked hard, <laughs> we all did in this election, and, and tried hard. But what do you see as the future? I mean, it, it just seems to me, if, you, if we had discussions about the United Nations during the campaign, the Republicans were, were horrible, and the Democrats were afraid to even say anything positive. So you're illustrating, I think, the need for this different global view, which of course comes back to the right. administrations and what's happening. What do you think is happening in politics in this country? I really believe that, that, that we learned in 2004 just how serious a challenge Democrats or progressives have. I think you have to talk about some things that are clarify where we are different and how we would go about it. No, you don't want to be known as the party of you know, abortion on demand or gay marriage on demand. But there's other issues, the, the, the war and the questions about what to do about it, the economy and the challenges and the directions we should go, the new kind of global work that we need to do, never just, just, just moved up. Don't you think that we also um, need to change the powers that be in the Democratic Party? And no matter how many defeats we have, we never can do that. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you were a very early supporter for Howard Dean. I was... Um, a delegate for Howard Dean. I believe that he would be a very good president and he would have discussed the issues we're discussing. And I think the Democrats are the one who did him in. I mean, not the voters, but the political establishment. It, so how do we do that? We're now going to elect a chairman of the National Committee and it's going to most probably be another insider with these people who lose every year. Right. And I don't know the answer. I really don't. I mean, I'm, I wish I could. I wish yeah. I could have had some quick. quick I even solution, think that the it's... whole interpretation that we talk too much about abortion and this and that is their machinations. I mean, I well, don't think uh, that's true. And I want to point something else out, which doesn't answer your question about who's going to do it. But I think uh, I don't support my friends who keep talking about about things, votes that were stolen this time. That was the story in 2000. Yeah. I'm not saying there's not voter problems. Right. There's serious voter problems. Absolutely. But the fact of the matter is we were out organized. And the best example of that is that in all of those uh, swing states, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, while the Democrats thought that we were doing organizing, we were trying to build our base in the cities, and we were trying to battle with the Republicans in those known suburban communities, when you got the post-election analysis, Carl Rowe was organizing in parts of those states that we weren't even in. That we didn't, we didn't, we didn't even go to. That we didn't even <laughs> right. seem to have the notion was this is like a rapidly expanding community. Right. And even in states where that where where those communities are more likely to be Republican, you need somebody there organizing to bring out the other people. Yeah, and it just doesn't happen. So, do you have any hopes for? For I mean, oh, I always we always hopes. have hope. Right? I always have hope, <laughs> yeah, and I do too. think that I do think that whoever gets chosen this year, and whichever candidates put themselves forward, not probably in the next three months, but starting, let's say, this spring, some Democrats are going to sit down, and even if people like Howard Dean don't have a position, they're going to have to talk to some of these people. They're going to have to look at, and and he, by the way, this is something I'm learning every day with my not-for-profit at the power of these websites. I mean, what Howard Incredible. Dean did is just unbelievable. Right. The reason that we already had this whole plan for tsunami relief is because you if this was it. 10 years ago, we yeah. would be getting our first checks around the time that you and yeah. I are having this discussion. Right. We got all our money in the first right. four it's, days. It's so incredible. Not all our money. We're still How raising money. How much comes money. in when you, um, when you get contributions over Huge the Huge amounts. How fast does it come in? Very well, in this it's, instance. Oh, it's just right on the credit card, right? Yeah. In this instance, right. it came in immediately. People, there's no waiting for the mail. That's I mean, right. So people nobody open makes a up pledge the and AOL. there it is. Right. Or they open up that's the New York right. Times and then they go to our website right. and then they give. It's just an incredible thing. And not only isn't? that, but the companies that you use to, to help you do this can tell you everything. About we know. The donor. Well, not just no, the donor, yeah. you only what the donor yeah. provides. But we can tell you for the last week how much money we raise in different hours of the day. On a chart, you just push a button on the computer. What's the says, best time of day to get money? Um, uh, <laughs> it, it, pretty predictable in the evening when people get home, but usually there's an hour. It seems to be around 11 or 12 in the morning as well. I mean, it's like who knew? <laughs> when they're at the office and right. they've settled in after making their calls. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> We're not supposed to use the internet, but anyway. Um, so, do you ever think about the city? 
Oh, I think about politics. This, yeah, I think about the city all the time. I do want to say I don't know that you feel the same way, but I do want to say first of all, our backgrounds in this instance are a little different. You know, I sort of, I mean, I think you set out to go into public service. I sort of fell into it. Yeah. And I felt like all well, of a sudden. Well, that's the other thing about what makes this, this sort of job so great, because you're a social worker. You're right. an agent for change. Exactly. You, that's what my favorite And I was doing, I was doing community right. change organizing on the right. West Side. And frankly, and this is a long, old story, yeah. but I went into politics because I got irritated with some of the local people who right. were representing me and said, I could do it just as well as he, right. which was a little bit nervy. But having got in, I then was but there totally for 20 true. years, <laughs> and I just adored it. So I felt as if I yeah. fell into this unbelievable life. And also remember, when I left, I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. I mean, I thought yeah. the Democrats should rally to right. not give Rudy Giuliani a second term. But most of that yeah. year-long election, I knew that I had made a choice right. not to stay as borough president. So the fact that I've been given another life and can now think about the city in a different way is wonderful. So the answer is I think about it all the time. I try to share with friends and with colleagues who are still in politics and with members of the press when I get asked some, some thoughtful reflections. The city still has a lot of work to do. It's wonderful that people feel so much safer, that tourism is so busy that you can't walk down your own block in some months of the summer, um, and that crime is down so dramatically. But we have other challenges, and I'm looking for candidates who will address them. Well, we've come to the end of our program. It goes so quickly. Um, you are truly wonderful, and the work Thank you're you. doing is great, and I do believe you have a wonderful life. I think uh, so, too. And just it, get, allow me just AJWS, yes. American yes. Jewish World Service, AJWS.org. Dot, dot, oh, dot org, I'm sorry. AJWS.org. And you can always Google it and just say American Jewish World Service. Or World Service. Thank you very much, Ruth. You're very welcome. Thanks, Ronnie. This is great that you're doing